In this problem, we're going to investigate the stability of a cube floating in water. Really, it's like an iceberg that we're idealizing as a cube. First things first, I'm going to draw a very simple free body diagram. So there are two forces acting on the block here. There's the weight on the block acting downwards, the weight, and then there's the buoyant force acting upwards. Assuming that the block is stable and in equilibrium, these should be equal to one another. So I'm going to say that the buoyant force is equal to the weight. Now the buoyant force is equal to um, the weight of the displaced fluid. So that would be uh, mg, like mass times g is usual for the weight. So in the case of the displaced fluid, that is going to be equal to the density of the fluid, which we're just assuming is the density of water here with a specific gravity of 1, times g, times the volume of the displaced fluid. Now remember, the displaced fluid, we're not looking at this top part of the cube here. We're only looking at the part that's submerged. So really, you could think of this as just the volume of the portion of the cube that's submerged. So this is just going to be h times l squared, because h, small h, is the depth to which it's sunk into water. And then the other two l's here, the l times l, are the width with the page and the l depth into the page. And this is equal to the weight of the full cube, which is going to be, again, mg, but we don't have the mass, so we'll write it in terms of densities and volumes. So that is the, the density of the cube, which we're given its specific gravity, so big S, times the density of water, times g, and times the volume of the cube, which has a side length of L, so it's just L cubed. Now let's simplify this a bit. These g's can cancel out, and so does the density of water here. And also, two of these L's cancel out. So we're left with an equation telling us that small h is equal to s times L, the side length of the cube. We'll just keep this equation into our back... We'll just put this into our back pocket, hold on to it for later. But now let's actually consider the conditions for stability. There are three points that are important to consider. First is the center of gravity, which for most very simple objects like this is just going to be right at the center of the cube. This is where the center of gravity is. Then there's also the center of buoyancy, the center over which the buoyant force is acting. This is going to be right below the center of gravity. And again, in most cases, especially with very simple geometry like this, it's just going to be the very center of the underwater region, since that is the center of where the buoyant force is acting. So this is point B. And lastly, the most important point to think about is the metacenter, which is always going to be somewhere above the point B, but in order for an object to be stable in its position, it also has to be somewhere above G as well. We don't know exactly where it is, but the condition for stability is that M has to be above G. So if we were to relate line segments connecting those three points, then MB, segment MB, has, is equal, of course, to MG plus segment GB. So one way of thinking about this is that in order for an object to be stable floating in water, then MG has to be a positive number. And this becomes clear if you rewrite the equation like this. So let's find a better formula for mg and see what that tells us. The length of mb actually has its own formula. It is equal to the second moment of area of the waterline area through the axis of rotation divided by the volume of the submerged portion of the object. Now first, let's talk about this second moment of area, since that can be one of the trickier parts of solving for the stability of an object. So the waterline area of this object is going to be the area over which it touches the water. So if we were to look at this iceberg, but from an aerial perspective, so if you were in the sky and looking down, and then there's all the water around it, then this square of the perimeter of the shape is what we need to find the second moment of area of. And this is where having access to Wikipedia 
or some reference sheet that gives you the formulas for second moments of area can come in handy. Because most of the time, they'll probably include the formula for a square or a rectangle. Now usually the formula for this can depend on what the rotation axis is we're looking at, but fortunately for us, in the case of a square shape specifically, it doesn't matter. Which is good, because the problem doesn't give us any hints about which axis it might rotate around anyway. But if you look it up, the formula for it you'll find is the side length of the cube to the power of 4 divided by 12. And remember, this is all over the volume of the submerged portion, which is L squared times H, the depth to which it's submerged in the water. Now let's clean this up a bit by canceling out two of those L's, so we just have L squared at the top, and then bring the 12 down, so we have 12H at the bottom. And let's get rid of this H too, so I'm going to replace the H with SL, since that was the formula we, that we found for it earlier, and then one of these L's cancel out. So we just have L over 12S. Now let's take a look at GB. So GB is of course just the length from the center of gravity, G, to the center of buoyancy, B. Now most of the time, especially in cases with very simple geometry like this, the, uh, the center of gravity is located right in the middle of the shape. So if I were to quantify the height of G from the bottom of the shape, I would say it's just half of one side length of the cube, L over 2. And as for point B, the center of buoyancy, most of the time, especially in simple shapes like this, this is located at the center point of the submerged portion. So the height from the bottom of this point could be written as lowercase h over 2. Therefore, GB can be written as L over 2 minus h over 2. And I'm going to do what I did for MB again and replace h with SL. So that's L minus SL, and I'm just going to put them all with the same denominator too, since the denominators are the same. And then I'm just going to factor out the L and the 2. So L over 2 times 1 minus S. So now that we've got some nicer looking formulas for MB and GB, let's rewrite our formula for MG. Again, keeping in mind that for the block to be stable, this has to be positive. So MG is equal to L over 12S minus L over 2 times 1 minus S. Now the way I'm going to proceed from here is I'm going to set this equal to 0. And the reason why I'm doing this is because we want to find the condition that will make mg positive. Setting this equal to 0 will allow us to write this formula as a quadratic equation, and graphing that will help us see where this function is positive or negative. So let's simplify this down a little bit more. That's L over 12s minus, and then I'm going to distribute, so L over 2 times 1, that's just L over 2. Then L over 2 times negative S, so that's going to cancel out with this negative sign here. So that's plus LS over 2 equal to 0. Then these L's can all cancel out. And I'm also going to multiply every single term by 2s. First off, it'll simplify things a little bit since it'll get rid of these things with 2 in the denominator, but it'll also get, it'll also get this s out of the denominator, which would make it hard for us to use the quadratic formula here. So now this equation becomes 1 over 6 minus s plus s squared equals 0. And then I'm just going to rewrite this in the much more standard, more recognizable quadratic form where we've got s squared minus s plus another term without the s, all equal to zero. Now, if you want, you can either graph this or use the quadratic equation to tell you when this equation is equal to zero. And when you do that, you find that s can either have values of 0 0.211 or 0 0.789. Well, now we've got these two values for s, but what does that tell us? Well, if you were to make a graph of this, 
a graph of this quadratic function right here, you find that the plot at these two points looks something like this, where it comes down, goes negative for a while, and then becomes positive. And these two zero points here are the values that we just found. What you'll notice is that in between these two values for s that we calculated, the graph is negative. Between those two values, mg is negative, which as we discussed earlier, when mg is negative, that means that the block, that the iceberg, is in a completely unstable position. So the iceberg is only stable as long as s, the specific gravity of the ice, is either less than 0.211 or greater than 0 0.789. I'm going to write that down now. Unstable for the case of 0 0.211 less than s less than 0 0.789. And this tells us that this iceberg is in fact stable because the specific gravity we're given by the problem is 0 0.88 which is outside of this range and is in the range of stability. So the answer to the question of whether or not the iceberg's position is stable is yes, because with the position that it's currently in, it would only be unstable for this range. So that is all for this problem. I hope this video helped you out. If it did, please consider subscribing, as that'll help me make more videos like this in the future. If you have any questions about this, please leave a comment down below and I'll do what I can to help you out. And if you have a request for a future video or you just want to hang out, I have a Discord server and my Twitch page linked in the description below. So that's all for now, and I hope you all have a lovely night. Bye-bye.